John Rule reads from the home farm. Take it away, John. The home farm. How long will we stay, Dad? Jay hooked his chin on the seat back to the neck, <clears throat> back on the seat back next to TM's shoulder. His dad smelled faintly and familiarly of sweat in the outdoors, even after cleaning up, maybe because he was always in motion. TM had arranged to leave their trailer house with a local man in Harrison while they made their extended visit with Grandmother Ivy on the home farm. Jay had mixed feelings on this trip. No sooner had they reached the hills that he'd loved since he was a toddler on Indian Creek than they were headed back away from him. But TM decided that there would never be a better time to visit what with the war heating up and the family not yet settled in any one place in the hills. The day after they reached Harrison, they packed themselves into the 39 Oldsmobile and headed northwest. Jay, Earl, the boys, and Brownie in back, TM, Little Nan, Baby Walt, and Vida in front. Oh, we'll stay as long as we want to, at least through Christmas. We've got enough guns and ammunition, and we won't be shorted on that. Got plenty of money from the Mobile War work. I sure want to get my fill of hunting with Buck and the boys. We'll have a good long visit and come back to our trailer in early spring. So after six years of wandering, and now with four small children, they turned back into the same chert and clay driveway at dusk of the following day and saw a yellow light, electric this time, streaming from the kitchen windows of the back porch. They saw the slender, strong figure of Uncle Buck open the screen door and call back, Mama, they're here! And then his grandmother's familiar upright shape outlined as she stepped out of the kitchen, drying her hands with her apron. The usual smother of exclamations took place as they crowded up the steps and got their arrival hug and a beaming survey look from grandmother. Jay still remembered his departure hug in 1936. The family pattern was one of hug, and one hug or so for arrival and one for farewell. The men didn't hug at all. They just shook hands real hard and bashed each other on the back or shoulder, exclaiming, you old son of a gun, or the like. Grandmother had warm food on the stove for them. They ate under the south windows at the old ornate table. Pretty quickly after, they carried in what they would need for the night and were bedded down in the downstairs bedrooms. Jay's folks and kids in the northeast room with the glass doors, Jay and Earl, in the tiny northwest room. After breakfast the next morning, Jay made his personal memory to inspection tour. The farm was the same but changed, and so was he, he decided. The tall two-story house had clearly seen no new paint since great-grandfather G.A.'s job six years before. Everything was smaller and dustier than he expected. All the pets he loved were dead. So Brownie the second fit right in. The old Ford Roadster with a rumble seat was gone, replaced by a dull tan terraplane parked in the same place by the new new building, which needed a new name and was no longer new. The two big draft horses, Dick and Jim, now quite old, survived. The steel love John Deere tractor remained, but a field west of the buildings was left fallow to weeds. There were only a few cows since Billy and Harley had married and left the farm, taking away Willis's help, except for visits. His dad and Earl had Uncle Buck out early after the chores, so Buck could marvel at all the guns and the ammunition found and bought, hoarded, really, from stops at the hardware stores and pawn shops on the way up from the Gulf. TM showed off the two Remington Sporter 20s first, followed by a Fox 20 gauge double, a Stevens 410 double with matted sight rib and ivory bead sights, a Remington Model 11 12 gauge, a used gun but with a good barrel pattern, and the Winchester City 63 22 Auto. Not to be outdone, Willis went in and got his two guns, his bolt action 22 repeater and his ancient 10 gauge Model 97 Goose gun a slide-action pump with no finish left on it. Jay got the feeling of some ceremony as the three men stroked and examined each weapon, then snapped it to the shoulder and swung on an imaginary bird beyond the yard trees. Uncle Buck shook his head at the wealth of ammunition being unpacked. TM knew that with the war it would be
become scarce and doled out by retail stores, so he bought it everywhere during the trip up country. At last, Vida began to murmur irritably about an accident with all that ammunition packed in the back and the boys and Earl perched on blankets right on top of it. TM laughed at that, but he cut back mostly, asking for one of the $20 bills from their secret stash of war work, war work money, only for gas or necessities. He did argue that guns and shells were a way of saving, easy to trade later or sell since they kept their value, the usual male argument for guns. No, he mentioned all the sugar they'd hoarded on the way to Harrison before canning fruit later, but Vida said that was different. After Willis saw that the guns and box cartridges were safely put up in the house, they fitted in the rest of their possessions, the blankets and the clothes, some food and coffee they brought as a treat for Mom Ivy and Willis, for both Grandmother and Uncle Buck, with both Grandmother and Uncle Buck helping them and advising. This was easy since of all the family, they were the two most open-hearted and sensible in getting along. Vida wasn't wary of them this time. She trusted Mom Ross's judgment and good nature, but still feared her religiousness. Jay's siblings never had to worry about fitting in. From the first day, they ran half-clad and shrieking indoors and out. A part of Jay always reacted like a prissy old man. Now he worried that it must be clear to everyone how poorly cared for and undisciplined the kids were. They were all healthy, though. Baby Walt was just a fat, vigorous boy baby in warm weather, usually naked except for a cloth diaper. On his personal memory tour, Jay instinctively went to the new building first. Even the painted part was peeling and sad looking. The whole structure looked simply weathered and older just from sitting here in the open for six years while he was being dragged through all those ugly and beautiful places from here to the Gulf of Mexico and back. He went in through the open shop side. The tools were all still there, on and behind the workbench. He saw one of the Bodark bows Uncle Buck had made lying on the rafters above. It looked polished but had no bowstring. It looked just dusty and unused. Jay went through the door at the back and into the grain storage area. This was where he always met and communed with his imaginary companion, Mr. Vivish, when he was left here at four and his mom and dad were gone, and grandmother and his uncles were so busy running the farm. He had come here where it was darkest, but where he was never afraid. Not like down in the cellar. He had come here lonely and humming to himself, peeking idly through the dusty cobweb windows into the deep incubator room, maybe wishing without knowing, and Vivish had appeared. A small person like him, impossible to describe, colorless, almost formless, under a small, neat hat, but a good listener. He never said anything. His responses formed themselves in Jay's mind and seemed always happily true. Jay never tried to look or stare hard at Vivish. He didn't like it. Jay felt warm just to remember that time. Vivish had answered a need for him. Uncle Buck or Harley had heard him talking to Vivish and made a big joke out of it. That didn't matter now. And Vivish wasn't here, not even a scrap of him. And Jay realized he wasn't afraid of the cellar either. Likely he'd never see Vivish again. After all, he'd be 12 in December. The cellar was only a food storage place for all the wonderful, colorful stuff Mom, Grandmother, used to can and save for the family. A 10-gallon crock of sauerkraut, rows of mason jars with tomatoes, beans, corn, jugs of Mom's tomato juice, turnips, potatoes, and slatted boxes on the floor. They'd carried some canned goods down there this morning, and Jay was shocked to see how little was on the shelves now, nothing like the days when his uncles lived there. <coughs> no longer was the incubator room used for hatching chicks. Now Willis laid out his hams and bacon sides on top and rubbed them with sugar cure. Jay glanced through the inside windows at them after he looked at the nearly empty grain bins. He walked slowly back to the big machinery in the implement room where the feed mill, cultivators, and harrows stood. The dirt floor sloped gently down where the big door stood slightly ajar. It didn't seem so bad. Even the unpainted pieces looked greased and oiled. The popping Johnny tractor just inside the door still showed plenty of green and yellow paint. 
He slipped out through the door slot and stood gazing absently over the large field that sloped gently up to the northwest. Some crows swirled aggressively over the distant line of hedgerow fence like flies over garbage. They must have a hawk or owl cornered. Let's go try out the boat, Jay flinched and looked around. Earl stood there grinning with a model cabin cruiser he'd built for Jay and Mobile cradled in his arms. Crafted from just lath and lumber scraps, it was a masterful job about two feet long and a royal blue and white with a flying bridge, a control panel, out, outrigger brackets, the works. Below the water line, it was painted rust red. Earl had taken it from the trailer and held it on his lap for safety all the way from the Ozarks. Okay, the biggest pool is close to the bridge where the cows go through. You lead the way. They went through the barn lot gate, past the old silo base, and past the horse and cow barns, then angled down the cow path to the tree-shaded bank of the pool. At this time of summer, it was greenish blue and slow. Jay thought this was about where Uncle Buck used to keep his fish trap. They crouched down to put the boat in the water. What you doing? They glanced back. Uncle Harley, out for the day to help Buck and visit, and to visit, had seen them and come to watch. They hovered over the boat again, watching for leaks or listing, as Earl set the sprightly, colorful model boat on the water. It floated like a duck. Jay couldn't help giving it a little push. A sudden puff of breeze veered it out of reach toward the far bank. Jay glanced around for a stick, but at that very moment, Uncle Harley said, Here, picked up a chunky rock and tossed it. Faithfully, it broke in the stern port corner with a splintering crash. The plow leapt sideways in the air as the rock rolled off. Bouncing drunkenly on the ripples, the boat touched the far bank. Earl ran to the ford a few yards off, skipped across on the stones and retrieved it. Cradling his damaged handiwork, not looking at either of them, he said curtly, I'll fix it later, and set off for the farmhouse. Jay felt physically ill. He stared curiously at Uncle Harley, who merely shrugged, raised an eyebrow, and turned back too. Jay watched Harley's blue overall figure recede toward the barns on the cow path. How fast it had changed everything. He was utterly miserable about it. But beyond his misery loomed a question, the puzzlement he'd always felt about this uncle. Why was he so different from Uncle Buck and the others? He was a grown-up now, working in Uncle Randy's body shop and married just a few months earlier to a sweet, carroty-haired young wife. Jay instinctively liked her when she came into the kitchen this morning. Surely by now Uncle Harley had quit complaining about being the youngest and being picked on the way he used to do. This had been just an accident. Jay didn't believe his uncle was antagonistic to him anymore. Still, he knew he'd never be able to forget it. It sat inside him like a rock. This first Saturday, some of the extended family gathered at the farm, not as much of a crowd as they could have been since Uncle James lived in a small town farther west in real wheat country, and Uncle Bill ran a cafe in town. Aunt Letty and Uncle Randy came out, though, when Jay's little cousin Ricky, now six, a blonde copy of his dad, but quick and observant and as quiet as Uncle Randy, was boisterous. On Sunday, Jay rode to church in town in the terraplane with Uncle Willis and Grandmother. Jay's folks and Earl did not go and never did go. This church building was different from the Buff Stone Methodist Church near the farm, which closed for lack of members the year after Jay's folks took him to the oil fields. Also, that year, Mom Ivy decided to take the family into the charismatic movement. Great-grandmother Betsy, the one who never smiled, the one Jay feared, convinced grandmother that the Pentecostal movement was the right way to heaven with its speaking in tongues, testifying, and dramatic public conversions. Perched atop a large concrete block basement, this church building sat high, bland, and white, a plain gable form with high and narrow steps to a small entrance stoop. Willis had helped redo it. For Jay, it lacked all the feeling of the country church. Many families crowded up the narrow steps. Jay's main impression was of a busy mass of cheerful persons. He went down into a basement room for Sunday school with a lady teacher who smiled a lot and had a starchy voice and used a blackboard and a felt easel. This part went dull and okay, but the main service really hit Jay. The years away from religious culture had relaxed his conscience. 
Brother Gocher, the minister, fooled Jay by his appearance, a slight and slender man in a gray suit with dark eyes and hair, a pale, narrow face set off by rimless spectacles. Brother Gocher more than made up for any slightness with a deep, grainy, penetrating voice that made Jay jump nervously. Mom and Uncle Buck sat where they always had sat in the country church, down close on the right, but Jay was sure he didn't like being that close anymore. After the announcements and the business stuff, they started off singing hymns they remembered about morning stars, sea billows, fountains of blood, and lambs and all. Then Brother Gocher began slowly after he read a text from Corinthians, and soon was striding up and down, his flashing spectacles searching every corner of the room. He pounded the pulpit with the heel of his hand, raised arms to heaven, beseeching God to flay them, lay bare their sinful hearts, flood them with the Holy Ghost, and snatch them from the flaming jaws of hell reaching up for them this very moment when eternity hovered just around the corner, for no man knew the hour of his desk, and it was death and gravestones came in all sizes. By now, many were already wet-eyed and crying out, Amen, Hallelujah. Others got down on their knees in the pews or lent their heads on crossed arms on the pew backs. One sobbing lady was being led to the mourner's bench below the pulpit. How did all this stuff happen so fast? Jay already had a nervous stomach from it all. All around him, people brokenly murmured, Oh, Jesus, Jesus including his grandmother whispering beside him. It really made him feel funny to see so many grown-ups crying. For all of sin and come short of the glory of the Lord, Brother Gorcher ended with a shout and a bang on the pulpit. Jay sure felt plenty sinful and miserable now. Let us pray, said Brother Gorcher, in such a mild, sweet, and musical tone that Jay could hardly believe it was the same man. The prayer flowed on a long time with lots of the same stuff as a sermon, but in an uplifted, pleading, singing tone, imploring but soft, yet powerful, begging God to fill their hearts, to refresh their souls, to bring them as dear sheep to their knees every night in holy, refreshing prayer. The vibrating tones of the organ ended and quivered, quivered around them. By now, Jay, by this time, Jay was convinced that he was in real trouble by the standards of anyone here certainly by Brother Gocher's, maybe even by Mom's, if somehow she could know his impure thoughts about girls and things. It sure didn't take much trouble, didn't take much to get in trouble with God. And he hadn't even realized it. None of this bothered him or had even crossed his mind since he left the farm six years before. All the while, he was dragged from one place to another. He was getting blacker and blacker with sin. But what of his deeds should he ask Jesus and God to forgive? He stared at the floor and the shiny seat back with his eyes quenched to slits. Well, he had tripped his friend Chigger in the third grade. Chigger might have been hurt real bad instead of just skinned up. And way back when he was six, he'd gone into that outhouse with that neighbor kid and his little sister and watched them for a minute before their folks rolled in home and scared them out of there. In the fourth grade, he bumped that little blonde girl so hard on the forehead and when he ran out at lunchtime, that was bad. She was all swelled up blue and yellow over half her forehead and big tears in her eyes. He hadn't even said he was sorry either. He had a big bump too, but that had to be different. He was bigger than a boy. And then lying. He must have lied sometime, though right now he couldn't remember telling an out-and-out lie. But that didn't matter as God knew all in his heart anyway and never forgot. And there were lots of ways of lying, just not telling all the truth or not saying anything at all. It was hopeless. Besides, the preacher just said everyone was black with sin from the beginning, dipped in it like tar. Better just beg mercy for being yourself, who you were. He started from a gentle, firm grip on his shoulder and looked up, dazed. His grandmother smiled down at him, still dewy-eyed from her own prey. People were moving out of the pew, and he blocked away. He jumped up, clutching his Sunday school pamphlet, and followed the shiny blue back of Uncle Buck's suit. As Buck moved up the main aisle, pausing for handshakes and exchanged greetings, kids and parents jammed the aisle. Some families with five or six and carrying a booted baby too. Jay knew what people did to make babies, all right, but what was bad sin if you weren't married was okay, and everyone smiled at you if you were. Otherwise, you were. You know, adulterers and whoremongers and fornicators. Learning to read early had taught him all the words for bad stuff in the Bible. 
Out on the steps in the sunshine, everyone was fresh and smiling like they'd just come from a shower bath. Uncle Buck paused to talk with the minister, who pumped his hand and squeezed his elbow. How are you, Brother Willis, he said. Uncle Buck reached back and pulled Jay alongside. This boy was praying so hard he didn't even know we were leaving, he said, laughing. Brother Gocher looked down at Jay kindly and patted his shoulder. Now Jay really felt he knew he was a little hypocrite. Uh, a white and sepulchre, that was it. As a result of that sermon, he had his first nightmare, slow and in technicolor. The end of the world and people he loved in white, all floating up with faces turned to heaven, while the glowing brazen balls of brimstone fell faithfully toward the wicked remainder, and he ran around beneath like a frantic black garden beetle. In his relief, after he awoke, he took all of his saved pocket money, almost two dollars, to his busy grandmother and told her he wanted to give it to the church seating fund. She looked at him askance and with her slow, quizzical smile, but she took it. He grew to actually dread the Sunday school, the Sunday church meetings, but felt obliged to go as the only member of his family group who did. He knew his dad and Vida took Earl and the kids to go fish and picnic after the terraplane drove off for town and church. In town, Uncle Randy and Aunt Letty belonged to the Methodist church. Uncle Randy's dad had been a Methodist minister, and Uncle Randy often cracked jokes about being a minister's son and about Tony BPM churches, meaning business and professional men, that is, Baptist, Presbyterian, and Methodist. Randy and Letty didn't tote Bibles and pamphlets around or talk about guardian angels and such out of church. It was really kind of a relief. But Mom, Grandmother, never tried to force anyone to attend church or pray. Everyone trusted and respected her. She'd saved the family farm and kept everyone going after Grandfather died in 1928 just by sheer character and physical energy. Jay believed from his heart that she'd never told a lie. He was old enough to notice, though, that some older family members might glance at one another when she told a family story. Anyone's memory could play tricks. Someone once said, and once great-great-uncle great Albert even laughed out loud and said that he'd been there too, but he sure didn't remember it that way. None of this shook Gay's faith in his grandmother, the person who'd saved his life, kept him from eating lie, cared for him as a little child, and the only one who always remembered his birthday with a personal card and a note. No other person ever did that. Anyway, it was still summer. The creek had plenty of water, so he took the tiny metal hooks they'd used to catch shiners at Mobile, cut a privet switch for a pole, tied on some of Mom Ross's heavy sewing thread, and hooked on a Cosmo flower head for a lure. He dapped and jigged the flower on the surface near the creek bank. He caught some large green sunfish that way. By and large, he was happy to be back here and to be reassured by the steady goodness of Grandmother and of Uncle Buck. Buck seemed just bigger and stronger and still lots of fun. He had always kept animals around for pets. He had a pet red squirrel now with a frozen off stub of tail that came and went through a missing pane in Buck's bedroom window upstairs. He fed her corn and she played in his closet and tried to make nests in his suit pockets with his neckties. Talking about Buck and his animals to Jay, Mama even complained some about the jackrabbit he kept in the pantry after Jay's folks took him off to Texas. <coughs> me. Well, I don't know if you remember, but just before your daddy took you away, Ted found it half froze in a field furrow while he was out early hunting. That year, 1936, we was just covered up with rabbits. Buck didn't have time to hunt them, so Ted was trying to thin them out for, before he left. Believe it or not, Ted killed 37 rabbits and a civet cat that morning just while Buck was milking. And so, well, your dad brought in this little jackrabbit in his jacket pocket, and Buck thawed it out and got some milk down it with a medicine dropper. He put it in a box behind the cook stove. Well, the silly thing lived. They're, they're not like a regular rabbit. A cottontail would have died, and Willis moved it into the pantry, put it that wide board across the door we used to keep the lamps in there to warm them up. Well, it just took over, thought the pantry was its home. 
And after it got bigger, that rascal started jumping at me. I'd forget and leave my have my mind on what I was after. I think I broke two good bulls when it, when it jumped on me with its hind feet. Thank goodness, Buck finally turned it loose. They were in the glass door sewing room at the end of the upstairs hall. This is where she packed away all the mementos and keepsakes. She opened a painted trunk to find things she'd kept for for Jay these years. She thought he was old enough to have them now, along with the mothball smell. Lots of different faint smells came from the bundles and packets she moved. First she took out a tied up flat cardboard box labeled Jay's Things and showed him the contents. His first school tablet when he was five and they let him pretend he was a pupil and sit in the corner of the schoolhouse. The pages were full of his early attempts at drawing things and at spelling and printing and numbers, really embarrassing stuff he didn't even want to look at. Messy crude drawings of boats and ho horses and houses with smoke curling from the chimneys. Some words were misspelled and letters and numbers reversed even in his own name. She clearly wanted him to take it so he just nodded and took it. Next she pulled out and opened a blanket box. From it she took a new looking suit of thick black felt so stiff looking it would be hard to wear. She lifted it and draped it over her lap. She said it had been grandfather's wedding suit when they married in 1906. She looked at it carefully and then folded it on her lap and reached to get a cardboard shoe box. Inside, wrapped in tissue paper, was a pair of men's high top moccasins with a thick border of black and pink beadwork. Bead work. The tops were buttery soft deerskin, but the soles were stiff as boards because they were buffalo rawhide, she said. She wanted Jay to have the moccasins. They came from the Apache Reservation by our family's New Mexico ranch near Ruidoso, she said, the place where Geronimo was taken to be sent to Oklahoma. Now he was really hungry to hear more about those early days, so she told him more, looking down at the wedding coat, which she stroked slowly all the while. It was a time when the army had mostly defeated the Indians and people from the states got on trains and went out to the territories to take up land for farms and ranches. Her folks, great-grandfather G.A. and her mother Betsy, had gone out as young marrieds and tried it a while but came back. It was less dangerous after a few years and they decided to try again. Instead of loading livestock and belongings on the train, G.A. decided they would go slowly in wagons taking a whole year to see the country as they went, sort of a moving education. So they went that way. They took their time, camped where they wished, and reached Galveston Island in 1900, but turned up country early enough to miss a terrible storm later that drowned so many. They reached the site G.A. had filed on and built a U-shaped ranch house at the foot of El Capitan in the Capitan Mountains. A wooden sluice brought water down the mountain to the house and the cattle pens. Free range for the stock stretched away into the distance. They tried cattle first, but they sickened and did not do well, so they switched to sheep. The men were out with the flocks on the range and came back in shifts from time and time to fetch supplies. School was in winter, 40 miles away in Lincoln, the county seat, boarding at the hotel for six months. So the rest of the year, Mama and I stayed at the ranch house and kept things going there while Dad and the boys herded sheep out on the range, lambed them and all, you know. Some of the ewes always has to have help. Worst thing for me was ever so often something happened to the sluice, the water trough for the house and pen. Boy, how I dreaded that. Because I knew what had happened. A big old bear up there would take a bath in the spring hole and he'd knock the sluice out of the way and that would cut off our water. Well, it was a good ways up the mountain and nobody but me to go. I was about 14 then, so I'd go 